Shut up and sit down. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. Bowhunter Chronicles podcast is brought to you by Tacticam. Tacticam is the easiest way to begin filming your hunts. Whether it's the budget-friendly solo or the Tacticam 4K 5.0, Tacticam has something for all levels of self-filmers. They even have the ability to capture your shot through the scope of your rifle or crossbow with their film-through scope system. They also have a new product coming out that we're going to be using, which is the Reveal Cell Cams. Um, So we're pretty excited about testing those out, and we've got some of those coming in the mail. So um, look for some info on those coming out here very shortly, but you can find those at Tacticam.com. And um, if you've been following along with us, I've been doing some things with The Vitals Live, uh, which is uh, like a for podcast listeners that are looking for something a little bit more that want to interact with the guest. Um, so it's going to be all tax, tactics based and there's no industry in it um, save uh, one day. Uh, during the week, we are doing some new product showcases. So an example of that would have been uh, Austin Cantola with uh, Genesis 3D printing. Um, he's starting to make some bow hangers, some uh, saddle clips, some stick talons, um, things like that that he's 3D printing. Um, and so we know that there's guys that have questions about that sort of stuff. So we're bringing them on um, to answer any questions and things like that. But it's going to be all tactics-based and a searchable um archive so if you want to know about bed hunting if you want to know about destination location security cover farm country hill country uh, any of that sort of stuff you'll just be able to click on there and go directly to the information based um, solely on what you're looking for and not have to weed through you know each and every episode youtube video um, all that sort of stuff and uh, so far we've had guys like dan infault john eberhart garrett prawl and uh, we've got some pretty other a pretty big guest coming up for uh, the rest of July as well as into August. And we're getting those uh, scheduled right now. Um, the next podcast that we're doing, it'll be actually, um, if you're listening to this, the day that it drops, uh, it will be uh, Wednesday, July 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we are recording on the Vitals Live platform using that um, recording our podcast. So what it allows you to do is, uh, you'll be able to come on, watch us as we're interacting, and then you'll be able to type in comments, heckle us, um, you know, make fun of what John's wearing and, and what I look like, um, all of those things. You'll be able to see that live as well as ask questions. And if you want to ask questions live, we can bring you in using that platform. So, um, you can actually, uh, be, part of the podcast and the same goes you know that's not just for this podcast it's just you know interesting that that we're going to do it on there so we can show you what it what it can do uh, but those are the same functionalities that you would have um, you know talking to Dan and Fault, John Eberhart and uh, any of the other guests so you can check that out at the vitals and um, so this week's podcast is uh, Garrett Benner the modern assassin and he is just that he is an assassin he kills and hunts just about everything and he's very very good at it his mantra is raw real no bullshit so we talk about industry not playing a factor um you know he he doesn't uh endorse gear uh, that he hasn't you know taken to its limits and uh, broke, re-engineered um, and all of that. And that's why he has very few products or, or things that he, um, you know, kind of stands behind. Uh, but what we're talking about with him today is bow fishing. So uh, we go from the origins of where he got started bow fishing, what you need, the basics to start all the way into hunting off of a hundred thousand dollar boat and what it would cost to uh, pay for a charter if you wanted to go out there and get some world-class bow fishing. And I bet you it's a lot less than you think because it's a lot less than John and I thought. So I know you guys are going to love this episode, and uh, it's definitely a great one. It was great having Garrett on here, so I know you guys are going to love it. Uh, But I can't let you go without talking about 
uh, giving a shout out to our Patreons. Uh, thank you so much. Patreons are crowdfunding for uh, creators and things like that. Um, and so it allows us to go on a lot of different hunts, go to shows, cover some of the cost of hosting and things like that. And basically it's just a donation towards the show. But because we don't feel like we're doing this, you know, for money, it's not the reason that we're doing it. It's not, it's not what drives us. Um, we take all that money and put it back into the show and do giveaways or give backs because Patreon doesn't like giveaways. So we do give backs. So we just give that money back to the patrons in the form of gear. Um, and so what we're doing for this quarter is we're giving away a set of B sticks and uh, we're going to be giving away a set of helium sticks as well. Uh, the Patreons will be favored in that, but anybody can win that. So if you're not one of our patrons, um, you could still win a set of helium sticks. Uh, we're giving away a Tacticam solo um, you know, to start, uh, filming your hunts as well as a base map package. Um, so it's a base map pro and, um, a swag pack and things from them. So, and we're giving away a membership to, um, the vitals live. So, um, you can check out all the things that I just talked about with that. Um, you can check that out at, uh, patreon.com forward slash Bowhunter Chronicles podcast, or you can go to bowhunterchroniclespodcast.com, click on the Patreon link, but either way, whether you decide to do that or not, we appreciate everybody that listens. And if you like the show and you want to help us out, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Uh, click the five-star review and maybe take the time to write a review and say, you know, we really like these guys because they suck at hunting and it makes me feel better about myself. Uh, we really hate these guys because they suck, suck at hunting and why do they have a show? Um, anything, you know. We're just looking for uh, feedback so we can make the show better each and every week. But this podcast right here is awesome. So I know you guys are going to love it. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Bull Hunter Chronicles podcast. We are sitting here, uh, not in the studio. We're in John's garage. Um, we got no internet and frank's garage still so we're sitting here no cameras no fun stuff um but we we're going to talk with uh, a guy so i think when i first got on social media and like got on instagram started following like the hunting pages i saw this like really vulgar angry um guy that was killing like everything under the sun and uh it just so happened to be the account was the modern assassin and it was uh, Garrett Benner. And so I've got him on the line today. We actually uh, met up and spoke, a, you know, briefly at ATA. And, uh, you know, if you followed along with uh, anything, uh, bow hunting, bow fishing, um, you kind of, you kind of can't get away from this guy. So um, I just want to thank you for coming on. And, and how are you doing tonight, Garrett? Uh, what's up guys? Um, I'm, trying not to be too vulgar or angry so I, <laughs> it's going well how y'all doing <laughs> do you get that a lot i mean from your um, from your social media uh to it i mean i got that that kind of is a perspective when people first get like a glimpse um but anyone that takes time to really look into my videos uh, or or especially read what I write. Um, a lot of my Instagram posts actually have pretty in-depth writing pieces that go with them. Um, so yeah, I get that, you know, especially, you know, being all tattooed and shit and everything, you know, a lot of people just get, get that kind of opinion right off, right off the riff, but pretty much, uh, most people that know me don't don't look at me that way at all. I mean, unless you you, you really piss me off, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, fourth arrow, I would say that would be one of them for <laughs> damn sure. <laughs> so um, let's get a little bit of history of uh, of you and kind of like um, I like to kind of give a a background, you know, so hunting style like how you how you came into hunting you're from a hunting family a lot of the guys we talk to are you know adult onset hunters and things so it's just kind of nice to have some you know a little bit of a perspective on where you're where you're coming from yeah my uh my parents didn't hunt at all but fortunately my mother's father and her brothers you know my my uncles they they hunted and i got to go I mean, a handful of times as a kid, and I absolutely loved it when I did. 
um, but didn't get to go a lot. But I was also that kid that was sneaking into my neighbor's backyard to cut some bamboo down around his fish pond to, to make my own homemade bow and arrows to go shoot bullfrogs and eat frog legs and that kind of shit. Um, and I, I, you know, my grandfather style hunt was you find a tree and well, can you see? All right, sit down, shut up. There, there, there was nothing really more to it than that, you know, as far as, uh, figuring deer out and what deer do and all. Um, when I got into college, uh, I, was kind of disconnected away from the woods and everything a little more. I still bought my fishing license every year and all, but I hadn't really been in the woods hunting for several years. And I bought a bow um, just to kind of do something more than, you know, just party and shit and kind of got more into the bow hunting. And, And my first trip out, I just, I learned so much about deer and movement and applied it to the next hunt and actually got into the same group of deer earlier while it was daylight and put a perfect heart shot on one of them. Um, and I was just kind of addicted from there. Uh, and I had always grown up skateboarding and doing crazy shit. And we always had a, uh, you know, a camera or something. And so I kind of transferred that same love into, into my hunting as well. And I've, self-filmed all my hunts uh since like 2005 i believe i've self-filmed uh about 99 percent of my hunts very few are filmed by anyone else and if it is it's uh by one of my homies from tattooed in the wild all right so um you know for guys that aren't familiar with you at all um you seem to have some sort of an accent where where did you grow up hunting and and when where are you now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I I get that a lot too. That is that is a question I get a whole lot, and I don't know. I think my I'm in Maryland. I grew up in I, I lived in Pennsylvania first. I where I originally grew up was called the Susquehanna Trails, and it was it was just that it was trails. It wasn't real roads. Um, you know, we didn't have mailboxes or trash service or anything like that. You know, some of my neighbors didn't have water and electric and now I'm in Maryland, but I don't know. I think my accent is just a, a product of, um, being a young kid growing up in the country, but skating down in the city and listening to nineties hip hop, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I think a lot of people can uh, relate to that. I mean, I grew up hunting but skateboarding was my whole life until i graduated high school now then i went good to the shit Marines and... good shit so you you've probably got uh you know quite a collection of broken bones and everything too then i my elbows are the, were the worst i didn't break a whole lot of bones but like my senior year i broke 30 skateboards in one summer and that was uh, when i stuck to ramp like i still am mm. just feeling right bone chips in my elbow right now (laughs) i I bet Uh, i broke both my elbows and my right elbow twice so yeah i know how that goes (laughs) so one of the things you know that i wanted to uh, talk to you about mainly today is like you are really big into into bow fishing and you've got like i mean the boat that you're frequently on is like this ridiculous rig you know and i think for a lot of guys, you know, for us here in, in Michigan, you know, uh, my brother-in-law's bow fished a lot. John's bow fished quite a bit, you know, but they say, you know, if you go over to Saginaw Bay, it'll change your life. You know, you can shoot a ton of fish in, in one night, you know, it'll, you can sink the boat. Um, and they're running air boats and these big giant, you know, all these lights and everything. And so it can be kind of intimidating you know, because you watch YouTube videos of guys doing it in canals and just, you know, with like piddly shit. And like, you know, then when you look at lever bows and, you know, the different reels and different things, I mean, like, you know, we can get into your equipment, but I know the reel that you're using costs more than the bow that I'm shooting right now. So, I mean, it it, it can be kind of intimidating to get into. So how did you get into that? And like, you know, I mean, what do you I need to start. That- it's really, I mean, it's really no different than hunting uh, as far as that aspect. I think as far as 
the intimidation level and the amount of information that's out there. And then you're seeing these guys killing these giants with $1,600 bows and $900 tree stands. And, you know, and it, it, it can all be intimidating. Um, my advice to anyone in any of that would be just start, like just start. And as long as you're genuine and you're generally interested and you're respectful, you'll find people along the way that'll help you out. Um, yeah, the boat that I have, uh, that, or that I'm on mo most nights, you know, the working class outdoorsman, um, that boat is a dream boat. I mean, that's exactly what it started as, is a dream. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time to come to fruition. You know, the bow that I'm shooting, the Oneida, and with the, the Mega Mouth Reel, like you mentioned, you know, you don't get more expensive. Um, but that's not where I started at all. Um, you know, my first bow fishing bow was like a Jennings Lightning with, you know, the cams on it that were like barely bigger than a quarter. <laughs> and it had cables, not even a real string, you know what I mean? Um I had one of those, uh, I had a muzzy reel at least, but you know, sometimes I, that would break. I had a, a drum reel as a backup that you just hand line line around. Um, I got, I went out with a buddy one time and loved it so much. I then put a bow together, you know, the, the bow that I had from when I was a kid and just the reel I could afford. And, uh, I decided I wanted to go bigger than the bank shooting like you're talking about, walking up and down the banks. And instead of waiting for other people to take me out, and I was eventually like, oh, hell, I'm going to build a boat. So I bought a bass boat, a little Sea Nymph 17-footer for uh, somewhere around 2000 bucks, I think, and spent, you know, I, in total, I don't think I even spent another grand. Um, buying amazon led lights and you know just some uh wire from the hardware store and some cheap ass batteries and my first old boat ran off battery i didn't even have uh a generator or anything and killed a fair amount of fish off that boat but you know i got into it so hard so quick i bought the boat and i set it all up and i was getting ready to go out and i was like oh shit I guess I need a boater's license, don't I? <laughs> like I, you know, I was just so, so involved in what I was doing. I even skipped the simple aspects, but you know, and I was new to, um, owning a boat. You know, I have been on boats many times, but not enough to where I was fully comfortable. And then especially going out at night, um, so I spent a lot of my first time out in a lake because my thought was, well, worst come to worst, my boat goes to the bottom and I got a long ass walk. You know, I know I kind of knew I'm not going to die out here on this lake. You, you know what I mean? Like, especially when you're uh, bow fishing, you're mostly fishing shallows and everything else. So. That was a way for me to just get acclimated to being out on a boat, handling issues, um, being out at night, learning to navigate at night, learning how to read your charts and everything else. And now, you know, we're out running sometimes 30 miles across the bay to check the other side if, if the wind's right and the tide and the moon is right, um, you know, for us to get where we want to go. And so John's kind of laughing because how did you start? Well, I started out and we had my grandma's old 14 foot V bottom boat. And, you know, I started out, I think we were 14. So my dad would let us, he would pull us down to the, we lived right by uh, Muskegon Lake and Bear Lake here where we're at in Michigan. And he'd pull us down and drop us off. And then we'd go out all night. And we just had a two by four that we'd stick in the front of the boat. And then we had a couple of nails and we'd have a lantern and we'd put some tin foil on the back side of the lantern so you could, you know, see and real not get... fancy reflectors. Yeah. Foil reflectors. Exactly. Well, at first you know, then we ended up having to wrap the, the uh 
the two by four with tin foil also because one night we were out there and we were out there so long that it burned the freaking end of the two by four right off. We almost lost the lantern. <laughs> but and we had, I mean, we started out. I think we had an, it was like an old American or something. Some it looked like a it was like a wood bow with the you know like what you were saying. It had the wheels and the steel cables, and we had a real seat that screwed in as a stabilizer and then we had an old zepco 808 was yep was yep. the real and we lost my buddy that would i would go with and then we just had a a freaking big like two by two stick that we we just pulled around because you know we could just go through the shallows and we didn't have a trolling motor or anything we just you know like an old skiff boat basically <laughs> Just like a gondola boat shooting yeah. fish. Yeah. And, I mean, we'd go out. We'd get there as it was getting dark, and we'd get back in the morning when it was getting daylight. And Yep. That's, I did that many nights and, and many nights myself. You know, not everybody's going to do that on a weeknight. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'll do it. And then get an hour of sleep, go to work, come home, get an hour of sleep, and then do it all over again. <laughs> um, you know, and that's that's basically – how I learned it all was just kind of being relentless in it. And, you know, when I say I set up my first boat with lights, I'm pretty sure each light was like 19 bucks a piece. And I had them strung together and I screwed them into big like clamps so I could just clamp it onto the rail of my boat around the outer edge. You know, I didn't even have a light rail or uh, yeah, it's just clamping Amazon light, shining as much light as I could in the water with the batteries I had and trying to stick shit. <laughs> and that that uh, 17 foot sea nymph, was it called a bass attacker? Because um, I had the same. Honestly, boat. I don't know, but it very well may have been. It, it was certainly a, a, a bass boat. Like a little modified V aluminum? Yep, yep. Yeah, we had that same boat growing up, and my brother got the. He was out there one day dinking around, and he scratched the bee off of it. So we had the ass attacker out there. <laughs> <laughs> Someone drew, painted an L on mine, so I had the sea nymph fell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times there. <laughs> but, yeah, from, from that, you know, um, one of the first things I did was get another bell and um, – I, it's still my backup bow now is the Poseidon from uh, Kinsey's from Fin Finder, F the, the Fin Finder Poseidon. That, that's a an awesome bow, in my opinion, for, for shooting fish and for the price of it. And I, like I said, it's still my backup today. I now shoot the Oneida and the lever bow and everything. Um, but. You know, I, I, I got that bow, and then I decided to get a bigger boat, um, and I got a 2072, and it had a deck and lights on it, and I actually sold the deck and the lights to my buddy Nick Mather, who is now captain of the Working Class Outdoorsman rig. So that's where he started was, you know, just a boat that he had for sea duck hunting and everything and put my deck and lights on it. And then uh, I custom fabricated my entire deck, light cans, everything. Um, and all that, like I said, it, it, it was the dream of, man, if, we, if I could build a boat, it would be like this and it would have this and it would have that. And that is the power plant that, that you see us fishing on all the time. Um, you know, it was just dreamed, designed, and eventually built. So uh, I just want to, like, unpack a couple things here real quick. Like, when you when you said, you're like, okay, well, I was on lakes and I had a whole bunch of things. You know, we had to come over, uh, overcome some adversity and, you know, l you learned a lot. Like, being out at night and bow fishing you know, what kind of problems do you run into? I mean, I know you, on the, you know, when you're out in the bay, that's a whole nother thing than being like on a lake. Um, and then the second thing, like, and I think is, you know, a lot of people probably ask, and I know that there's like, at least around here, like rampant problems with, uh, uh, I don't know, bow fishermen getting a bad rap for not 
doing something with the fish, but what do you do with the fish when you're done? Yeah. So, um, I guess the, the first question first, uh, the adversities, um, you know, when you're fishing shallow water, you, you're, you're going to hit bottom at times, you, you know, you're going to get shallow enough to where you may have to push out, um, whether that's having a push pole or getting out of the boat to push it. Um, you, you're going to have things like line getting wrapped up in a troll motor and you're going to maybe have to take the trolling motor apart. Um, you're going to have batteries go out and have to rewire something. Um, all those types of things. And I found, you know, all of that was, especially at night and mostly alone, was safer there in the shallow waters of a lake than out on a river. Um, where you have current to deal with, or like you said, not even necessarily bay and big water, but just having tidal water is completely different. I mean, some nights we'll go in and we go right over top of a tree and then, you know, we may go back on, on the adverse tide a week later and that tree that we just rode right over top of is now four feet out of the water on the bank. Um, so you, you got to learn where and what you can run. Um, and the main thing is, is don't be stupid. Take your time. Um, you know, if I'm going somewhere new, I like to check it out in the day, then fire up the lights at night. And then at least I know my route. I've seen my route through the daytime. And I know, are there buoys I got to look for? Is there a shallow somewhere? Is there no wake zone? Or, you know, you, you just never know. Um Second thing, as far as fish, getting rid of fish, um, it all depends what we're shooting. Um, but I guess, you know, most people, they think of bow fishing as shooting carp. Um, I've had guys take them for turtle bait. I've had guys take them for raccoon bait. Um, a lot of times we just took them to a, a hole in, in a farm and dumped them and they just that's where they also threw dead cows and shit like that. And it just turns into a fertilizer over time, or we'll take them out to deep water and where we are in Maryland, it is legal to do so. And what you, you can just dump them, which gives everyone a bad rap. As you were saying, even though it's legal and you can do it, it gives a bad rap. So what we do is we'll go out to a deep water somewhere and we will make sure we slice them open and slice the air bladder so if you slice the fish open and you cut the air bladder they'll sink and put it this way when we're on the tidal waters in places and we're doing this and we dump you know 60 carp in a trench at night we have some crabbers uh that that are very happy for that type of information um <laughs> You know what I mean? We're kind of preset for them. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's legal or, you know, the catfish will keep. We eat the, the snakeheads. You're not going to find a better eating fish than that. But for the most part in Maryland, you're shooting invasives. Um, and uh, invasive species, there's not a whole lot of regulation on. Um, now, if you're an asshole and you're dumping fish at the ramp, you know, hopefully – the officer cites you with one waste, you know, or, or improper disposal if if you're doing it improperly. But there's ways to do it respectfully um, and not have to deal with several hundred pounds of dead fish in your boat, you know. Right. So what is your seasons like? I mean, are can you shoot all season? I mean, all summer long? I mean, obviously, you know. Probably not much well, again, in the since we're shooting mostly invasives, there's not really regulation on okay. them. Um, and as long as there ain't ice and the water's clean enough, uh, we can generally find something to kill. <laughs> so one of the things when you're talking about that boat, so my father-in-law has a uh, so Uncle Frank from the, the listeners podcast. He's had this boat forever. And it's just, my, you know, my brother-in-law took it over. He's got a fishing boat now. And uh, it's this 16-foot modified V that we're going to make into a bow fishing boat. John was actually looking for one. And I'm like, hey, I, 
I was actually looking for another old C nymph like we used to have because that was <laughs> those that was like a perfect little cheap platform to start with. But this one's free. This one's so. free, so it's even cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Can't but, beat that. Right. But so you know, it, we're talking about you know, I I heard you say, well, you just started with lights and then you went to you know, didn't even have a generator. And John's like, well, I'd rather have a jet, uh, lights and big batteries than a generator because generators make noise and they make, you know, vibration. vibration in the water and stuff like that. So, I mean, what's your opinion or like your experience with generator versus, you know, batteries? And then what kind of lights, you know, because there's the what high pressure sodium lights and then the LEDs where they try and match yep, the fucking whatever. Yeah, that's what I was just going to mention. Um, I think pretty much every question you just asked, I can kind of break down and sum up into the question of what is your water quality? And what I mean is LED is great for clear water. If you have a clear water lake, you can't really get better than LED for the amount of power they require, for the amount of light they output, um, for the amount of heat or the, the little bit of heat they output, they're, they're hard to beat. Um, but if you have murky waters, stained waters, you, you can't beat LED. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, the HPS. Uh, you need the HPS for the stained and the murky waters. And it's it's this is something I go through all the time with people. They want to compare lumens to lumens and power consumption to power consumption. And that all kind of makes sense, but it is not fully practical in bow fishing. And the reason being, like, if you ever watch a slow-mo video with an LED light, a really good slow-mo camera, you'll see that LED light flickering and pulsating. It's because they don't have a, a continuous um, driver. And so you're getting a pulsating light, whereas an HPS is a solid glow, and it penetrates deeper into the water and especially into stained water so guys think you know they can get a led that's the same wavelength color wise uh that orangish glow and it's going to do the same thing and it, it just simply doesn't translate the same because of the pulsating of an led and how they work they both have their place i mean the the rig you're talking about the power plant that badass boat. There's a reason it has LEDs and there's a reason it has HPS. Sometimes we fish all of them. Sometimes it's one or the other. And then what's what's driving those when we're talking about batteries, generators, so you know, that, that sort of conversation. You're, you're gonna get you're gonna get more uh as I was just saying, the lumens, you're gonna get more lumens per power consumption from the LED and you can run LEDs off of batteries um, or have them run off a generator. But HPS, you, you're, you're not going to run HPS off of a battery. You're going to need a generator. Um, and it comes down to, you know, where you're fishing and what's your goal. If you have a little clear water pond or lake that you got access to or clear water part of the river and you want to go out for four to five hours with your buddies, you know, you can get away with having two batteries for your troll motor and having, you know, uh, run your, your lights on two batteries and then switch them up in a couple hours to two extra batteries. Um, but if you want to, really get a lot of light and you want to you know even run troll motor uh without batteries you can you know put everything onto to a generator and uh that in itself is a whole new game too because some generators are insanely loud some are quiet some are inexpensive and some are not you know everybody wants those honda whispers and uh that's what i ran um but some of the new ones out that are specific for bow fishing, like the generators from PowerMax, they've got a bigger amperage, um, you know, bigger amperage breaker. So they're ready to handle all that. 
and specific for bow fishing and you're getting a nice quiet generator and you're not paying out the ass for it like you would a honda what if you already had a honda <laughs> if you already have the honda i'd use it just like i'm doing <laughs> well and that's what i was telling john i'm like well i've got that you know but he was talking about the vibration of the boat and right just because like we're <clears throat> where we're at when we're out in uh, like bear lake or whatever the water is a little bit murky but so I see what you're saying with the LEDs now, but uh, the, the you get so close to the, you know, by the time you see the fish, they're so close. And I remember just when we were out there, you know, even pulling through there, if you just bump the boat or sh- shuffle your feet and they'd be, you know, they'd just be spooking. But, you know, you know it, it's, that's one thing that's hard to say. Um because, you know, sometimes we're running a troll motor. Sometimes we're running a mud motor now. Um, we, you know, Nick got this idea and um, we decided to put a kicker, a mud motor as a kicker on this <laughs> boat. And I don't really think anyone's quite done it. And it's pretty badass, let me tell you. But it puts out vibration for sure. And. I don't know, man. Sometimes it seems like, you know, literally fish don't move until we run into them. And sometimes it's like every fish is out there at the edge of the light. Yeah. Uh, honestly, what I think I found fishing small craft, even to large craft, I think what affects those fish more than a vibration in the water and everything, or even bang in the boat is if someone walks from one side of the boat or the other and they send a little wake, yeah, um, even a slight wave, I think that spooks fish more than the vibration. Um, you know, and even the light, it, you, you got some fish like shad, they're stupid. They, they want to swim right to into it. the light <laughs> and then it's like the vibration of the motor makes them crazy and they do dumb shit and jump out of the water, or swim oh, yeah. right into the motor. Um, <laughs> large mouth bass they don't move no. they almost roll sideways like they're trying to be like a solar <laughs> panel soaking up the sunlight um they just like don't move um big catfish big catfish are the most weary of light of anything most of the time you see them on the outside edge of the halo of your light and they just kind of don't ever let you catch up to them um you know, they're all a little bit different species to species as well as as time. Um, and if you fish a, a dead still tide, most of them times, them fish are not moving. They're just kind of dead still too. But then it's harder to see them when nothing's moving and they're just laying in the weeds. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, there's, it's no different than deer hunting. Like you figure out, why why is this deer coming to here and when um you know same thing it's why are these fish here on what tide and why um what is the the the, why is this deer coming out on this wind well what's the water level going to be like with um the wind blowing across the bay and blowing extra water into these coves tonight um you know it's all these little pieces um to identify and i i i I don't know it's strange that most guys their bow fishing is carp and an occasional catfish where here you know we can kind of get a mixed bag when we go out of carp catfish snakeheads gar um suckers quillback goldfish um maybe even a koi uh you, you may be able to shoot all them in one night and sometimes in one area. But if we're specifically targeting one of those individual species, we, we go after them all individually, completely different. Hmm. Yeah. See here, we're, I mean, mainly it's probably 90% carp. We, we used to shoot gar, you know. Yeah. Chris shoots a lot of gar. I mean, I, I'm really kicking myself last year, Memorial Day, like right on the river where we were camping, there the guard were spawning right in front. I mean, they were just everywhere. Yeah. And uh, but it, and then we used to have. I mean, like you're saying, the shad, shad. those 
dumbass things. I I do remember that. They would just come s- swirling in right in front of you. Like, come on, shoot me, shoot me. <laughs> yeah, it, well, I'll tell you, it's getting crazy up here right now o- on the Upper Bay. Um, this is kind of really the second year that we've been having the Blue Cats come this far up the bay. And they're following the shad and they are ready to spawn and the bow fishing for the blue cats right now is absolutely insane um actually just had uh tim wells up here for uh, about a week shooting blue cats um and, and got to film him you know all aboard the power plant with working class outdoorsmen and uh recorded for his show for for the outdoor channel and all because the the blue cap fishing right now is just insane so uh, i i'm glad that you brought that up i mean i got a bunch of other questions about a bunch of different topics but since we're on the the topic of of tim wells like we we met him at ata 2 years ago and uh my father-in-law couldn't shake him every every time we turn around he's talking to tim wells just awesome guy i mean just a fun dude but how does um uh, fuck i don't know what, what do you call it? blow fishing with the fucking blow gun like how do you the blow gun <laughs> yeah what, how did that go down i mean how are you retrieving these fish or you know what did he have the string on the end of it what was he doing um, yeah yeah i mean his blow guns um his blow guns have uh you can a reel seat and you attach a a little reel just like it is you know, just like you would think of bow fishing, except it's just a tiny reel with real light braided line on it. And, um, you know, one of his goals was he, he was like, I want to put these blow guns to the test on a bunch of different shit. And, you know, by the end of the week, we had actually manipulated his fish darts a little bit. And, you know, the kill rates were going up. But, you know, it was actually pretty funny. He shot a big snakehead and it took off and it wrapped all in the weeds and then all in the snot grass and then in a bunch of other shit. And we're like, man, if you try pulling him in, it's just going to rip the dart out of him. And next thing you know, Tim Wells has got his pants off and he's in the water <laughs> and he's going after that fish, following the line. He's like, come on with me, boys. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So he, he's a madman and he wasn't going to let it go. And, you know, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's tough. Uh, I tell you the first night I about blew my lungs out and <laughs> I watched my, my dart bounce off of several gar and carp and everything. And, you know, we, we modified other things a little bit and, um, you know, it's actually pretty cool, uh, we got a lot of underwater footage. Um, so that, that was one of the things that Tim wanted. And I said, I can make that happen, man. So, uh, you can actually see on his Instagram, a video of a goldfish getting shot underwater with an arrow, but we got goldfish, we got catfish, um, even a snakehead underwater camera view with a blow gun and all as well. So, it was fun. It's definitely difficult. Um, I mean, if you, you you remember the Tim Wells, how he would start some of his videos saying, you know, I've come to the conclusion that the reason the caveman went extinct was they were using spears and spears just didn't kill things enough for them to survive and live. It was the inefficiency of it. Well, I mean, the same's kind of true for a blowgun, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's not the most efficient thing, but it is a lot of fun. Oh, I yeah. mean, it is really cool and just something different to blowgun, especially for some reason, blowgun and them big goldfish and shit like that. It was just really cool. That's definitely on the list. I have my slock master blowgun sitting right behind me on the workbench. Hell so, yeah. <laughs> I've killed. Um quite a few chipmunks now with it <laughs> nice nice he, he, he'd be happy to see that um yeah so he's actually working on a couple little new tweaks on it and um you know he actually left me with his blowgun when he left 
Um, so I have the slot masters blow gun and <laughs> I'm getting ready to drill holes in it and do some other shit. Cause I can't ever leave anything alone and got to <laughs> try to make everything better. So yeah, t- Tim Wells, actual blow gun. They killed a bunch of shit on TV. I'm going to start drilling and cutting. Them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, you know, John and I are familiar like a little bit. Um, with the snakehead and we've got like an open invitation to go out with our buddy. He's in the Virginia DC area, but they hunt the uh, seek a deer in, in Maryland as well. Good and, shit. Uh, and he, you know, he's like, you need to come out here and we'll, you know, we'll shoot some skate and we'll, you know, go after the snakehead. But he talked about it as more of like, kind of like hunting. And I've heard you talk about it in the same way. So f- for people that aren't familiar with snakehead and like, I, I heard you, I mean, we did a podcast with the white tail distraction guy. So I listened to a few of their podcasts and um, listened to the one that you were on there and you were kind of talking about like you, they weren't even in your area or they weren't thought to be in your area or whatever. You guys tracked them down. So what are these, these snakehead? Yeah. So yeah, Charles and Austin, they're awesome from uh white tail distraction. Um, yeah. So basically they were, these, these are fish that, came from asia apparently how it went was there was this old chinese dude and his wife was sick so he got these two snake heads to make medicine for his wife whatever and apparently she got better and he released the two snake heads into this little neighborhood pond right outside their like apartment complex basically and from there it flooded and got into a tributary that led to the Potomac River. And those two fish just happened to be a breeding pair. And they lay 100,000 eggs or more at a time. They can spawn three to four times a summer. Um, They protect their fry and their babies. And, you know, it went from DNR was actually putting like a bounty on them for killing them. Um, to just there's no chance of eradication once they start to get established. Uh, they're now in <clears throat> in every tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. They are up into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, uh, New York, down in Virginia. Um, several other states are reporting to start to see them, and I bet a lot of that is due to a uh, bucket biologist. You know, people say, oh, I wish I had snakeheads near me. And then somehow there ends up snakeheads. Um, you know, I, it, it happens, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, it went from being here in the upper bay and having to travel down to that Virginia, D.C. area to go shoot the snakeheads because that's where they were. To, you know, every now and then you'd hear a rumor of someone seeing one or catching one and this and that. And, um, you know, it was three years ago that I spent an entire summer out there fishing and I saw one that I was positive was a snakehead. And it's just like, well, he's lost. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you, you know, the next summer... Uh, you know, the, the summer before that was rumored there around, didn't see anything. And then I saw one the following summer and then Nick and I, we went out kind of, you know, we're, we're hard headed. We're out there earlier than anyone else, just cause we're itching to get on the water and start hunting some fish. And we were just going out looking for car for cats, just something to shoot. And I said, you know what, man? I said, if snake heads are here. I know where they're going to be just just from hunting them on the Potomac and kind of knowing what they like and everything else. And I said, if they're going to be here, I I know where they'll be. And we rolled back to this spot and there was four of them laying there on this little mud point. And we each shot one and we were like, holy shit, they're, they're here. And from that point on it, is there's only gotten to be more and more and more and more um you know as many as we're killing it makes zero difference zero so at at that point do you feel like uh the fucking dan infault of snakehead hunting where you're like 
if they're here, they're going to be, this is where they're bedded, right? You're going <laughs> <you're gonna> to go <laughs> and, and track them down. Um, to a degree, I, I mean, yeah, and, and it's funny, you know, Nick and I, we've spent so much time out there and doing this that, you know, we'll find a spot and there'll be zero snake heads and we're like, but dude, come back on a low tide and this shit will be fucking dynamite. And, you know, we'll wait until we got the wind and the tide right and go in there and there they are, a creek that we couldn't find any in. We may pull up and pull seven, eight, you know, even ten out of a, a little spot that, you know, on a different tide seemed meaningless. Um, you know, I guess it's kind of like a buck bed. Like, you know, if 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 you got a steady south wind, you know, buck's not going to bed in a spot that's good for a north wind. Um, they're just not going to be there, but you may recognize that spot and say, well, on a north wind, this buck has got this view and then this back cover and can bed here. And, you know, OK, now that you got that north wind, that's that's your time to slip in and try to kill him. Uh, another thing that's interesting is, you know, I've always said, like, uh, big white tails and all like. If you thought about humans and money was no object, the most badass son of a bitch is always going to live in the big mansion on top of the hill because it's the best spot. And he's going to remain there until someone kicks his ass or he gets killed. And then, you know, the next badass is going to move in the mansion. That's kind of like the way whitetails are with their betting that, when you find that prime bedding, if you remove the big buck out of the area, it's pretty, you know, pretty well can not guarantee, but assume that another good buck of a decent caliber is going to use that area. And we find that with these snakeheads. We have spots where even if we're not seeing fish, we say, OK, get ready, guys. There's going to be one here. And nine times out of ten, even if there aren't fish in other places, there'll be one on this specific hump or right outside this specific log. And it seems like sometimes you pull one out of there, you can go back 15 minutes later and him be there. Or, you know, snakeheads have super hard heads, and I, I'm just always aiming for headshots. I just naturally, I'm, um, you know, you see on my Instagram story and shit all the time. We say headshots only. And, you know, it's just what we aim for. And uh, I've glanced my arrow off of their heads several times. And sometimes it's later that night. Sometimes it's two, three nights later. You'll just see him near the same spot and you'll see that white streak on top of his head and it, it gives him away. You know, he's there because of the scar across his head. <laughs> um, but it's kind of like they almost go back to the same spot or near the same spot. And again, some of those spots are completely dependent on the tide, just like whitetail bedding is completely dependent on the wind direction. So, so this is probably going to hurt your heart a little bit. Um, but I am not a fisherman. Like I don't, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't intrigue me like at all. I don't know. I grew up fishing and I feel like I, I love saltwater fishing because I never know what's going to be on the end of that rod, you know, but I feel like here, I mean, I've said it a bunch of times and John, you know, my father-in-law and everybody, they're like, I mean, the fuck Frank's leaving tomorrow and they're going to go to Augray and they're, I mean, they're getting, they, they had. Uh, the the captain there that we stay at his house, um, I mean, they had a limit by like nine o'clock this morning and it's like eight, eight walleye per guy. And it's just like what John will say is meat fishing. I mean, you're just fucking running planer boards and it's reeling yep, in the yep, planer boards. Stacking it's, the freezer. It's just <laughs> stupid for me. Like the planer board, it's more work than the fish when you get it off there. And I'm just like, fuck this. And John is always like, you know, when I go out, I'm hunting these fish. I'm looking for that. So when you're saying like you're going out, let's hunt some fish, you know, is there different times of year where you're going after different fish? Is it different tides? Is it different weather condition? I mean, uh, break that down for me. Um, every single, every single one of those aspects, um, 
you know, if we're let's let's just pick carp for an example. Um, you know, you're you're gonna start to find them in winter, um, normally in a little bit deeper water, and usually when you find one, you find more. As it gets a little further along and starts to warm up and they start to feed, they kind of move about a little more. Um, then when it comes to spawn, that's when they start to gather up. Um, and they start to do different things. They'll just stage and sit in these grass flats overnight waiting for the sun to come up and, you know, to, to start finding and pushing these females around and, and bump the eggs from them uh, to start fertilizing in these grass beds. Um, and then after that's over, they kind of almost disappear for a little while. Like, like, like they go back to a little bit deeper, maybe cooler water, start feeding, um, you know, and the snakeheads are the same. Like, when they started coming up out of the mud, like, you, I mean, we were literally riding right over them and not seeing them because they were just laying still in the mud and they had no color to them, no pattern. Um, and, <clears throat> and it seemed like all the big ones were emerging first. And not long after that, we started seeing some smaller fish and not long after that, 80% of the snakeheads that we killed had other snakeheads in them that they were eating. Um, you know, then they started all of a sudden they were just gone from the places where we were finding them every night. The temperature shot up with, with a, a week of sun and those fish were completely gone. Um, now, where we were hunting them and killing them uh, a month and a half ago before the grasses popped was completely different than where we're finding them now that, you know, some of the floor is covered by two foot of, of grass bed. And, you know, uh, there, there may be acres upon acres of a mud flat that we were fishing that's now completely choked out by lily pad. Um so, yeah, it's, it's you know, again, it's really no different than the whitetail. What's the food source? It, has this field been cut? Is this overgrown? Is, you know, where are they being pressured even? Where, it, you know, that's one of the biggest things is when I used to go out fishing in the flats, I would see one to two other boats in an entire summer. And now it's nothing to have a dozen or more boats that you can visually see from where you're fishing. Um, so that plays a big factor in it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's all factors to break down as to where and what you're looking for. And, um, you know, I'm pretty good at recognizing those little cues. And Nick is actually really good at documentation. So I can be like, hey, you you remember that one time last year when it was windy and the moon was high and we were in so-and-so and we crushed them up against the banks like they were sitting still, not even moving. Yeah, yeah, that was, and he'll look at the dates. And then we'll say, well, let's try that. And we'll check a spot. And, you know, most of the time, holy shit, the fish are doing about the same thing, you know. <laughs> so you can start to learn patterns on them. So, um I would say it's safe to say that you work on this boat and you guys work together. Um, let's let's talk about a little bit about like let's say that somebody just wants to go out there and and fish with you guys. Like what are the, what does it cost and like what's the expectations? I didn't think guide is going to have this. And then the other side of it is like what have you seen? Because I mean, like my father in law, we, we do a bow hunting podcast, but he used to charter steelhead and and uh and salmon and it was like you'd get guys from fucking so we're in you know mid michigan whatever we're like two and a half hours from chicago and like we'd get guys from chicago out here that didn't know how to fucking you know reel a reel or or, or do anything you know so do you get uh, the next part of that is do you get guys that have never fucking shot a bow before they just see like all the stuff where it looks cool and then you get people that want to target specific fish. Like from us, charter fishing in Mexico is like 
Some people want to go after sailfish. Some fucking captains want to go after sailfish because that's where they get their big money. And then other ones, you know, it's more fun for us to catch Spanish mackerel and little tuna than it is to catch, you know, one sailfish, maybe. Yep. Once again, yeah, good good perspective and analogies on that. Um, So anyone that wants to fish with us, just look up uh, Captain Nick on Instagram at the working class out, uh, at working class outdoorsman. Um, and the rates vary depending on the size of the group you have and if it's a weekday or weeknight. But figure it's, uh, you know, if you're figuring with your tip, figure about spending 200 bucks a night. Um, and that's for the night of fishing, all the gear. Um, and, you get what you pay for. I mean, there are other services around us that are cheaper, but you're using a lot cheaper equipment. You are you on a smaller boat that's not as just, bright. Just real quick, um, John, what do you think about that price? Because that, I mean, you've been fishing in Mexico a whole bunch. You've been fishing. I mean, you own all the equipment for fucking big water fishing and like that. What do you think about that? That's about the tip for. One I know. Those. That's what I'm saying. Like that. See, I mean, when I see the boat, when I see like the success rate and stuff like that, that seems like I would have expected in the th- like 500, th- you know what I mean? Like 800 bucks. Yeah. 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 We, I mean, we try to be as fair as we can. Cause you know, Nick and I came from the same place, a place of passion without having, a financial backing or money and wanting to do shit and, and just working it from passion. And then it got to the point where, you know, he decided he was going to make the investment into becoming a bow fishing captain and building the most badass boat on the East coast. And really that's what he's done. Um, well, well I didn't mean to and, cut you off. I just want to put that in perspective for the listener because like, like listening to that and like, well, like I said, like following along with like your Instagram as well as Nick's, like it, it looks to be in my mind, like world-class bow fishing, you know, that I, I'm glad you say that because that is one thing Nick and I say to each other all the time, especially when we start getting ahead and we back up and we're like, look, we're making working class world-class and that's one of the things we say to each other to kind of get each other to refocus sometimes um, and make sure we are doing the absolute best we can. And I tell you what, the, the, this this went further with me than about anything was uh, a piece of advice Tim Wells gave me and something he said when it was just he and I in the truck one day, uh, he said it. I have fished with thousands of charters and boats and captains and people. He said, and you guys have something unique. Um, and it is the best part of your operation. And he said, I, I, I don't know how you're going to take this, but it's you too. He said, and what I mean by that, he said, I've seen shit break and I see you two fix it. I've seen this happen. You two get it together. I've seen the fish not be there exactly where we left them the night before and we should come back and find them and they're not here and you guys figure out he said and i know anything that happens out here even if it was me getting hurt i don't have to worry and he said and that's why this has been one of the most badass bow fishing and bow hunting adventures i've ever been on and that is what we are trying to provide the working class guy with a world class experience. That's awesome. Yeah. So, like I said, I didn't want to cut you off, but I just wanted to say, like, that seems absurd as far. I, I appreciate <laughs> that, you know. And we have we have guys that, you know, they'll that they'll you know complain about the price, and then they don't want to tip just because you know they're usually the guys that don't know much about fishing or hunting and haven't been on a guide service and really understand what works or appreciate things like from a le- uh, uh, a knowledge standpoint like you guys being familiar with what things cost and you know if someone dry fires a bow 
That's, <laughs> you know, these are lover bows and it can really fuck them up. Sometimes we can repair them on the spot. Sometimes it's like, well, this bow's dead until we can get it to the shop and order new parts. Um, you know, those reels are 300 bucks a piece. If someone's not fully pulling that T-bar and they're just half-ass holding it, it's just burning gears. Um, you know, some guys, they just can't get the concept of how to do things and they'll lose five to six arrows in a night. And, you know, all that costs money. Um, but we're, we're, we're trying to meet the, the working class guy. And, you know, we have some guys that say, all we want, we want to book for, we want to book for late June. And all we want to do is, is take home a cooler of snakeheads. That's all we care about. We don't care about shooting anything else. We're like, well, I wouldn't book for late June then. <laughs> I mean, if that's really all you care about, yeah, we'll get you a couple, but you're not going home with a stack cooler full. You know, um, we had a group not long ago. They wanted snakeheads and, and, and Nick put them on them. And they booked another trip and Nick and I went out the night before and scouted out some really good spots to take them. And they showed up and they're like, well, tonight, all we want to do is shoot fish. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't want to go after snakeheads again? I'm like, nope, we want to put the most fish on this boat. Any client, any charterer has I'm like, all right, well, that's what we're doing then. <laughs> um, you know, so it, 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 we had a guy that he had been after snakeheads for two years and hadn't killed one. And the first snakehead came right sitting there. We drifted the boat right next to him. It's three feet away from him, fully lit up broadside. It's a 30 inch fish, probably, probably just into, if not just below double digit. And the guy sat there. And next thing you know, the fish kind of turned and it was out of light. We're like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I froze. He's just <laughs> like, that is like that to me was like watching a 170 inch buck walk by, <laughs> you know? And then after he shot his first fish that night, he was so ecstatic that he didn't want to sit up front of the boat anymore. He let everyone else get up front and everything. He wanted his snakehead. He got his double digit snakehead and that's, you know, that was a two year quest for him and that's all he cared about. <laughs> so you get a little bit of everything and yeah, we have guys that come on board and we're like, they're complete professionals and they know exactly how to shoot. And they, they know exactly how to use the gear we've got and we have some complete novices and I will tell you this, and this is 100% truth and honesty. People that have never shot a bow or been bow fishing are the easiest people to teach. Because when you have shot a bow for a long time, you are used to, your brain is in tune with hitting what you're looking at. Well, the thing with bow fishing is that fish is not where you see it. Where you see that fish is not where that fish is physically located due to the refraction water anyone that's been fishing has stuck their fishing rod deep down in the water knows it looks like it bends off at an angle you know no your, your fishing rod's still straight it's just the refraction of water so people that aren't really familiar with shooting you know they shoot and you'll say next time you need to go lower you know concentrate pretend there's a fish underneath that fish you want to hit and they'll get it and there's people that shoot and you can tell them lower and lower and lower and you can spell it out and you can scream it and everything else. And they shoot four inches over top of that fish every time because they're used to hitting what they're looking at. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I mean, John's here. Uh, John, uh, we, like, like I said, we need to get a setup where we can have all the cameras and everything. But like, I mean, John's doing hand and arm signals fucking re up for all the refraction <laughs> for, for this for that when you're talking about breaking bows he's got his hands on his head you know like the the whole works um yeah i mean it's it well and anybody that's followed any of my shit knows i i break damn near everything i touch and that's why you know a lot of these guys um send me stuff to use because i know if it can handle my fishing style um, or, or, or it can handle being on the working class outdoorsman boat 
and the way Nick and I truly put gear to work. Um, if it can handle us, it can handle pretty much anything. Like, I guess I want to know, like I heard, you know, like I said, I listened to that, that, uh, white tail distraction podcast. And I listened to a bunch of the podcasts that you've done on your own podcast and a, a whole bunch of other different things. But uh, I think, uh, I was going to ask, like, what's the craziest thing that you've had happen, you know, while you've been out there. And then I guess I just want to go like one further is like, maybe if you've been out there, like by yourself or whatever, but then the other part of that is if you're out there with clients, right? So, I mean, I work in a service industry where I have to be like incredibly professional and sometimes things happen and you have to like downplay them. Like it's not a big deal. Um, what's the craziest thing that's happened like with a, a client or whatever, where you've had to like manage it? Like, Oh, it's not a big deal, but like, it was like a serious situation. Yeah. Um, well, I think most people that book with us are pretty familiar with us. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things they appreciate is we're, we're, we're giving you what's real, you know, and we'll tell people like, Hey, it's going to be a rough boat ride tonight. If you want to kill snake as we can go here and shoot other fish. But if you want snake, I'm just telling you, it's going to be a rough boat ride and it's going to take a while longer and this and that. And, you know, we've, we've had motors break, um, to where we learn we're like well we're fucked boys hang <laughs> on for a while like you know there's some things that, that you can't candy coat and sugar coat um i mean nick, nick got got stuck one time and had to wait a few extra hours for the tide to come back in and change and thankfully those guys were really cool they were they were having a small leaf contest shooting leaves as they floated <laughs> by and whatever else just uh to pass the time but um yeah i mean you you're always gonna run into some problems um that's one of the reasons that we kill a lot of fish and kill more than most of the other guys out there is because we put ourselves into positions that most guys won't or can't um i tell you i get a, an extreme workout on that boat pushing that thing around and nosing it off of these flats and everything else every night that boat's a big bitch but it's kind of like you know you said you're not much of a fisherman but it's kind of like fishing if you're not getting hung up every now and then and stuck and losing a lure you're not fishing where the fish are right. and it, it's the same with, with us bow fishing if we're not bouncing off of a a log and hitting some mud flats and running the troll motor in weeds and, and half sunk in the mud. Sometimes we're just simply not getting to where the fish are. Um, now as far as crazy shit, um, man, uh, well, one night, um, I realized every time I was kicking on my bilge pump and my bilge pump was running, I realized, uh, you know, I'm, there's no water squirt now on my boat, so there's no water in it, right? Well, I realized that it had a small stone in the impeller, and it was keeping the impeller from turning. So the bilge pump was coming on, but it wasn't ever pumping. And I had, I think, six people and about 70 dead rays in the boat. <laughs> and... So right there floating out in the middle of the bay in the middle of the night, I had to get, you know, in my boat and rewire a new bilge pump in. And then we're sitting there for about 20 minutes just pumping bloody rainwater out. And uh, everybody's just kind of chilling and got a drink, sitting down, relaxing. And everybody got back on the front deck as I filled the generator up again and as soon as I pulled the generator cord, everybody on the front deck backed up and huddled together in the middle and was like, holy shit. It was like, what's going on? You know, cause I'm down kind of down below in my boat. And they said, as soon as the lights came on, there was like a eight foot gray shadow right at the front of the boat that just kind of slowly turned and went under us and was longer than my boat was wide. So 
pretty sure we had a bull shark circling us in the middle of the night out there while we were just <laughs> pumping bloody ray water. Um, so that, that was pretty interesting. Um, I got a call from Nick one night, you know, if I, if I know he's out, especially with his older boat, um, you know, now he's got the new boat and all, it's not as big a deal, but if he's ever out, I always keep my phone on, um, just in case he ever needs help or anything goes wrong. And he called me one night at like four o'clock in the morning and I could just tell in his voice immediately something was up. He's like, dude, I need you to stay on the phone with me. I'm like, all right, what's, what's going on, bro? And he's like, uh, you know, that Creek, we looked at at the map. We were going to go check out tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I decided to check it out tonight. I'm like, all right. He's like that spot where it necks down to about 20 feet wide. I said, yeah. He said, we were pulling through it and we just happened to look to the side of us. And he said, there was five people standing there wearing all black in black hoodies with white masks just standing on the edge of the river bank where it's only like 20 feet wide he's like and i gotta go back past these fuckers to get out of here <laughs> he's like just stay on the phone with me dude <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he turned back around went back down and they weren't there they, they were gone but you know, you never know what kind of weird shit's going to happen out there. That'd be some creepy shit right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was creepy enough that he called me, wake me up at four in the morning, knowing I was going to make fun of him for it. You know, so you you know it's something serious when you call a buddy in that kind of situation. <laughs> oh, shit. <clears throat> so what uh, you're, you're shooting the Oneida on the on the uh, for the bow fishing rig. What are you what's your bow? for uh white tails i am shooting the lobo the the lone wolf bow by darton okay. um i guess um y'all get a little lucky insight here that no one really knows about but um i've been talking with the dequistos for quite some time and uh we decided it was a good move to partner up so I am going to be uh, hunting with and even giving some design implement and and decisions on, uh, or maybe not decisions, just design uh, influence and ideas with Lone Wolf Custom Gear. Oh, sweet. Okay, so, you know, we want to know the rest of the shit, like the arrows and all that bullshit, but, I mean, now you've opened, like, this whole can of worms. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean... Darton's a Michigan company, and I can remember, like, way back in the day, like, that was my brother's first, like, and, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest, so, like, I got hand-me-down yard sale shit, and my brother got yeah, a brand Darton, new bow. my Darton <laughs> came with a tag. It doesn't even say made in the USA. It says made in Michigan. Yep. So. And, uh, <laughs> and we saw those at ATA, I think, two years ago when they were first coming out with them. So, like, I mean, how do you like that bow? Does that have that? Same cam system as the Spectre does, where it's like the it, that adjusts the cam lean and everything, or is that what is that built off from? Do you know? Okay, so yeah, the basically the riser is like the DS thirty eight hundred. Okay, but um, I, I spoke with with Ted who works right there below Rex, and oh yeah, yeah, it does Ted. have the new twenty twenty dual sync cam system. So it is, you know, it's not just the, the, the DS3800, that bow from a few years ago that's just made with the, the Lone Wolf, uh, touch to it. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the DS3800 riser, but with limbs and the 2020, uh, dual sync cam system. And I tell you, I'm impressed with this thing. Um, I'm shooting 29 inches, 70 pounds, the same as I was in my elite. And I'm shooting the same exact arrows. And this bow is burying my arrows a few inches deeper. And I shoot the easy V sight. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't had one in my hand. I've, I've been like going back and forth on it. And it's, okay. it just seems like well, such a 
crazy dude premise. i absolutely love it as soon as you start shooting it but my point in bringing that up is i'm shooting the exact same draw weight the exact same draw length i'm shooting the exact same arrows and i am using an insert for 20 feet per second faster out of this lobo than the insert that i am shooting in my elite is it the same brace height i mean are you is it similar this, uh this is a six inch brace height i'm not sure what the brace height on on my um or on, on my elite was okay like i said uh, we i want to know about the arrows and the broadheads and you know all that we got the sight uh, we'll yeah, get the so, rest, but. yeah, I use the, the easy V, which I mean, it, it, anybody that's looked into is actually this morning recording a video of the easy V before I took it out of the box and put it on my bow and everything. Uh, absolutely love that site. I'll have a video out on my YouTube soon about that site specifically. Um, Aaron Lasko is an awesome dude, but. My arrows right now, I am shooting the double helix from Dirty North, um, DNA, Dirty North Archery. Um, not many people are familiar with them. They're a newer company out of Oregon. Um, two brothers, good guys, and awesome arrows. The double helix is a um, medium, medium arrow that's thick-walled. And I have FX inserts on them, and I'm shooting 125 grain uh, Zeus. Um, this year, actually, I'm going to be shooting 125 grain Aries broadhead. But my arrow weight with my wrap, with the lighted knock, and this setup is coming in right at about 575. Okay. And what do you? What's your draw weight? 70, 70 pounds 70. yeah i think the, when we checked this lobo it was a little hot and it was almost about 72 but yeah 70 pounds okay yeah and so i mean like i said you opened like pandora's box with the fucking lone wolf gear type stuff so <laughs> yeah kind of crazy <laughs> well i mean because you know Obviously, the Assassin's Reach from, you know, the modern Assassin, you know, you helped design that with Matt Garris. And I, I would have yep, to assume yep. you were using one of his platforms um, from before that because you saddle hunt as well. So yep. what are you going to be using this year then? Are you going to be using, um, you know, that Lone Wolf Custom Gear arm and then the, what is it? I can't, I can't even think of the name of the. Because they're all named fuck. They all start with the A. The fucking assault, fucking ambush, ambush, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I talked about with the DeQuistos before doing this, I said, "Look, guys, you know, I have a lot of my own ideas and everything, and a lot of things that I still wish to make." And, and I said, "You know, I don't want to just use Lone Wolf gear." and promote just your gear like i i, I want to have some input and see some of my ideas maybe come to fruition as well and you know the more i got to talk with cody and then got to really spend some time with andre face to face at ata and talk we decided there was a lot of ideas that we could help each other with and um right now i will be hunting with the saddle still and I have a, uh, a prototype um, from Wild Edge that was made with my camo pattern. Um, so I'm still going to be rocking that. But I found several times that I wish I had a stand. And I actually said this a while ago. As soon as I saw the .5, the, the, the DS.5, the new DeQuisto series stand that's only 5.5 pounds, I was like, that's it. That's the ultimate. I said, because then you have an actual stand, but it's small enough to work as a saddle platform, but it's big enough to work as a tree stand. Like, there is nothing you can't do at that point. And I had actually said that's what I was going to do before – um you know, I had really spoke with Cody about becoming part of the Lone Wolf team and helping 
with some of the design aspect. And, you know, as far as Drew at Wild Edge and Matt Garris, you know, we're, we're all good and everything. And um, I had a feeling that this may have come to fruition. And so for a while, just some of the way some of the things were going and some of the other people they were working with, um, we just kind of kept a little more distance and respectfully. You know, that way they know I'm not trying to uh, dig into their pockets or ideas for anything and vice versa. And, you know, um, I still have nothing but good things to say about both Drew and Wild Edge products and Matt Garris and Out on a Limb products. So, um, you know, just anybody that's familiar with me, it's, uh, you know, straightforward, raw, real, no bullshit. And that's just the way I've kept it with everyone. So, you know, there's nothing left into question. Everybody knows what's what and everybody's cool. So are you still going to be running the Assassin's Reach camera? I believe so. Um, I, I, I haven't got a chance to really, really play with the lone wolf pocket arm i i've played with it at ata and things like that and i will say if you want the absolute minimalist lightest easiest to set up arm i don't see how you can beat the pocket arm um but when i designed the assassin reach i also wanted more versatility and fluidity for my filming and i think that the assassin reach is more versatile and it works really well in my system the way i hunt so um as of now i'm going to keep using the assassin reach i am open to using the pocket arm to see if it will you know meet and fit my need but um you know there's still some each has their advantages is the way i look at it yeah, so since, you know, we don't have one, and I'm, you know, I go back and forth because I got to buy all this shit myself. So it's like the Lone Wolf Pocket Arm, I think you're right as far as like packability and all of that, but I think you don't lose a whole lot of packability. If you were to put like a six point bat wing type bracket on that one point on the top, that's my only hang up with it, as I feel like you put. A thousand dollar camera, five thousand dollar camera, whatever. I don't know. I don't. I don't have one of those, but I know they exist. On the end of that, my my concern is that one point of contact at the top. You know, if you were to put, you know, a mini bat wing, you know, kind of like a mini, you know, what you'd have on your cheese stand on the top of that, and you could still turn that ninety degrees. Like that was my concern about it. And like I said, I, I did the same thing as you. Like, I only got a chance to fuck around with it at ATA and, and look at it. But what I did is like, so I had the fourth arrow bases and arms and all that shit and didn't really care for them. I sold all the bases. I still have the arms. I've got the three piece and the two piece. And I had Matt make me his own base that fits it. And then I have an Assassin's Reach that that fits it as well the just the base so i just ordered just the base from him and i think that's gotcha. what we're going to be running this year um and I, I almost brought it over here for john tonight he's running the 97 pound muddy outfitter arm i'm looking at it the right now. giant triangle <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean he gets all my my hand-me-down stuff so everything's just trickled down and i, I mean I, I think you're right to be able to put that in like your the entire thing in your cargo pocket and if you were to run because i'm running the fc 300 so with a ball head i found that that's fairly easy to use because i got to touch the camera to fucking you know there's no remote on it or anything anyways so yeah if you were going to do something like that to be able to just put that in your pocket would be great but my concern is that top flipping out but you know i mean you've got insight so i hope that you get to handle yeah one and get and to say, i mean you know, the thing I, I wanted to be able to use it in any and every situation. And I have used that camera arm on a limb. I have used that camera arm on a down tree that I'm 
sitting behind in like a deadfall. And at that point, it's like almost more of a tripod. Um, I have I've actually used it uh, off of a tree sticking out that I then had, you know, my jacket draped over as a little blind. Um, I've even strapped it to down logs to use essentially as a tripod to film some of my recoveries, um, you know, and, and just talking about the animal or the hunt. Um, I really just tried to make it with full range versatility and the idea that I had and some of the products that Matt had already, um, I had, you know, the feeling that we could make it and make it work. And, um, I think we were pretty successful in it. Yeah. I know a lot of people that really like it. Um, like I say, it's just, you know, you're kind of fucking in like the crosshairs of a whole bunch of shit with climbing systems, platforms, fuck, you know, the, the whole yeah. thing. Like you've, you know, that, and that's one of the things that I find like, you know, for, for us, like I do my best to only bring on guests, but guests are, I guess, one of the things where everybody has their own story and insight and whatever. But when we start to talk about products and stuff like that, you know, it's either got to be something that I think is like innovative or different, or there's a story there. You know, we don't associate with a whole lot of products or a whole lot of shit because, you know, as soon as they make some bad thing it's like well then you're, now you're beating the drum for this piece of shit you know and so now you've yep, got you've got yep. a whole bunch of companies you know that are all in the same space like jesus what a you know you got balls man <laughs> you know and that's that's well, i appreciate that <laughs> and um you know that's one of the things that i've always kind of been sponsor free is because no one's paying for me to say what I say. Um, if I don't fully believe that this product or this piece of gear is going to help me kill deer, I don't need it. Um, and if that's my opinion, I don't mind paying for it. And, you know, and then that way, when I'm telling you this, like, like perfect example, the EZV site, I saw it and I was like, you know what? That's a really good idea. And me being left eye dominant, right hand shooter, maybe that'll help. You know, I, I didn't I didn't get the phone number or send an email and, you know, say I'm the modern assassin and try to swing dick. I, I, I ordered one. You know, I jumped on the website and I ordered it. And then after a year of using it and killing animals and promoting it, um, I then had a specific question and I got a hold of Aaron Lasko and we talked for a minute and then he saw how much I had promoted it. I had been using it and I actually give him some input or he passes, you know, some ideas and design info to me. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because I do have my hands in so many different things and view things from so many different ways. Um, so yeah, I, Coming up to now um, work with the what I consider to be the elite of them all in Lone Wolf Custom Gear. Um, you know, I, I I didn't take it lightly when I got a message from Cody DeQuisto saying, what's it going to take to get the modern assassin to work with custom gear? Um, you know, to I, I took that as a uh, uh, high praise and I still do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to prove my value to it. Well, I think that's great, you know, and, um, I can't wait to talk to you again. Like I said, I feel like we've just kind of scratched the surface on this because, you know, with it being summertime and, you know, kind of like the, everybody is thinking about whitetail and things like that. But I think more people are thinking about boating and the ways to fucking, you know, Still get not out, die have fun, in this heat. Kill, kill some <laughs> things, you know, at the, at this time of year when it's not necessarily peak time for, for whitetail. And that's funny because I feel like I, I'd imagine you feel the same way as like somewhat we're in an echo chamber, right? So you, we're talking, you know, when you go on social media or whatever, you're seeing people like trail cameras, scouting, hiking, getting ready for this. But 
the average Joe Blow or the guys that aren't like serious about, I mean, I guess as serious as we are or whatever about hunting, they're just like, well, you know, I'll pick up my bow maybe in like September or, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's it's hard to like step away well, from I, that. I, honestly, I think that boils down to, um, you know, how many passions do you have? You know, if, if I wasn't so engrossed in bow hunt, uh, bow fishing, I would be thinking a lot more about, you know, this falls bow hunting. And, you know, sometimes it slips by. It's like, holy fuck, I never got a camera out or my mineral sights in or, you know, or whatever it is. Or I really wanted to check that stand and shit seasons in two days. Yeah. You know, um, so I think it's, you know, how many other passions are you involved in? And that's why, you know, I always say I'll never master one thing um, because I, I just have too many different places that I'm involved in and in trying to be skilled and successful in to ever truly master one of them, um, which those are your guys that are out right now. Um, you know, doing the scouting and everything else and, and beat the ground 365 for those whitetail. Oh, yeah. And, and, but that's what I'm saying. I was like, I feel like we're in an echo chamber because I feel yep, like yep. there's a, it, I'll be extremely gracious and say 25% of the hunters that do that. And I know that that's a, not the case. And there's so many other people that, you know, hunting, maybe their passion but there's so many other things that that get in the way and you know for us to do this on a weekly basis and talk and network and do all the things you know it's it, it's it i mean there's a accountability piece and i think like when you talk about never pat uh never mastering one thing like from the way that you do your podcast your video the way that you do most of the things that i've followed you're a lot like John and the fact is like you don't do things like 50% or whatever. It's just like, well, fuck it. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it like this where with myself is like, well, I'm going to pick and choose like where I kick full throttle, you know, like I can, I'll, I'll yeah, go easy man, through I, the whoops, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm a full believer. I, I got too much shit to do. So if I'm going to do something and take the time to do it, I'm going to take the time to do it right. And um, I'm also my own hardest critic. So, you know, um, I think that produces quality, but uh, not necessarily the quantity that a lot of people are uh, used to or a lot of other people put out. But I try to, um, you know, I, I try to be a tier above, you know, and the guys that do put the 50% or, or even the guys that put the 80%, you know, I, I try to just keep, keep my content, what I'm doing a little bit above. And I understand that what I do isn't for everybody, but, um, you know, something I said a long time ago is no matter how sweet the peach, there's just some asshole that don't like peaches and is going <laughs> to tell everyone else that they shouldn't either. So, there's no one I can pretend to be or anything that everyone's going to like and, and side with. So why be anyone but just straight up myself? And what you see is what you get. And, um, you know, it keeps life pretty simple for me that way when, when everything's just straightforward. No bullshit. You know, same as this transition um, between, you know, me using and, and working with Wild Edge and out on a limb to – now going to Lone Wolf, you know, a lot of people is, well, you're that that's all competition. And it's like, well, competition breeds innovation and you, you don't have to be cutthroat to be in competition. And when everybody is just, you know, this is what it is and, and there ain't no bullshit, and no deception, you, you know, then um, guys that are are real and keep it real with each other can continue to work and, and be friends. Yeah. I mean, it, there's always going to be assholes. So, I mean, I, I said a long time ago also is that I don't need any more fucking friends. So 
if you don't like me, then I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, right? I actually yeah, had a if sign. If you don't like me, there's like <laughs> six or seven billion others I'll take my chances with. Right. So I'll, I'll survive somehow, bud. <laughs> right. So uh, with all the content, everything that you're putting out, because you're on a lot of different things, you know, where can people follow along with you? And then, you know, with, uh, you know, working class outdoorsmen, you know, the, the charter, all of that, like if somebody wants to come out and, and fish with you, you know, how can they do that as well? Yeah. If, if you want to, um, if you want to come fish or see the content or talk to the captain, um, at, or just follow a page that's flooded with stacks of fish on the deck and killer shit getting done. Um, working class outdoorsman on Instagram. He doesn't even have a Facebook page or anything. Just working class outdoorsman on Instagram. Uh, if you want to follow me, most of my stuff um, is promoted, talked about most current on Instagram as well. And that is at the underscore modern underscore assassin or just type in the modern assassin i'll pop up in there um that's my youtube channel the modern assassin i have the kills it podcast so instagram kills a podcast or youtube kills a podcast um so i do a little different dynamic podcast with with my video and the way I splice in content. So, and, um, you know, it's, it's raw, it's explicit and it's not a hunting podcast either. It's, uh, just about men and women that kill it at their craft. So it's not always hunting. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I've recently been filming several more videos. I'm about to release a video that, uh, I basically go over, my climbing and hunting system that I used last year before I'm going to implement the, the DS, uh, 0.5 into my hunting. So just how I was using my wild edge steps and out on a limb platform. Um, and just there's a couple tips and tricks in here that I'm going to reveal. They're going to have some people like, why the fuck didn't I think about that? Um, so, yeah, I, I got a lot of content I'm going to bring forward. So that'll be on um, YouTube, The Modern Assassins, and then it's all linked together at themodernassassins.com. Awesome, man. Well, I think that's all we got for today, but I really appreciate it, and it, it's been it's been fun, and we definitely need to connect um, after or during deer season, Sika season, you know, go over that type of thing. Um but I think we need to make a trip definitely out east. I mean, it's, I think it's got to be it's got to be done now. For well, sure. I tell you, it'll be a good time. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on for real. It's been fun. Awesome. Thanks. Right.